that night was the worst night ever when we got home. It was the worst night ever. We just cried all night at both of us, like cuddling each other. The person she was to how frail and timid that she ended up, you know, you're like, ah, it's just, you wouldn't wish it on anybody. I've been told with Laura it's short term. What am I looking at here is like, so I can start planning things, like, because I'm thinking maybe months, years or whatever, eh? She's like, Mark, she says, I've been advised days. Dry date and we're on. Today on the podcast, the Devlin Brothers podcast, where we talk all things about bravery, sacrifice with a strong focus in mental health. Tonight, we've got the honour and the privilege to welcome the legend that is Mark Boyle, <laughs> aka Mr. Magic. Mark, welcome to the show, mate. Thank welcome, you. Mark. Thank Thanks for coming in. It's a privilege to be here, guys. Excellent. I'm looking forward to opening up to you. Brilliant. It's not, it's not often to open up. We know this, mate, and we thank we thank you for your time and that kind of stuff, mate. So we need to get right into this. Right. Yeah, right. Big time. Right. Excited, a bit so. of background when it comes to Mark. Mark is an ex snooker professional. Um, plays the pool, eight ball pool, professionally. He's a IPA tour event, multiple event winner. Plays for money, right? a zero money match player as well. Right? But this year, Mark's life kind of turned upside down with the tragic loss of his dear wife, Laura, in February. Is that right, Mark? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So before we get into it, um, any thoughts, JD already? Yeah, well, I'd, I'd, I think we should start when you first picked up a pool cue, Mark, and we'll go from there. So if you can you can talk us about what age you were when, when that happened. Uh, first Our snooker cue or pool? Uh, what, what one was it first? Same thing. I still I play pool with a snooker cue. So, oh, do you? Aye, uh, so because uh, a lot of players that play pool have got a smaller tip, but my tip's 8.65, so that's kind of... A bit big for a pool cue because right. of the cue, the cue ball's a lot smaller than a snooker ball, so you kind of tend to go down a size. So I've always played with a snooker cue. So what age? Two. Wow. Two. Two. Really, yeah. mate? I never I, knew that. Two. I just kind of. Wow. I must have been the. It was all my dad and my, my well, obviously my mum as well. She, yeah. They, they used to watch a snooker, or I used to, or they used to put it on because I liked it. I don't know, but. Uh, must have just been the colours on the on the table, like on on the telly that I liked, and seeing the balls moving about. And then my dad, well, my mum and dad got me a table. It was a big six foot table as well. Really? They, they used to lie on the floor, and uh, that was that's when it all started. Uh, when I was two, but my my granda used to slag me all the time regarding it because it would be it was probably the worst table ever <laughs> it had rips in it uh, there was no nets in the pocket so we had to use socks for uh, so the, the balls didn't fall down you know yeah. so uh, uh, that's when it all started when I was two and everything was a blur to the end, from then till I was seven right what do you uh, mean a blur like just you're a kid, so yes, you just you, right, you, you just, forget things. You, you do, just do, of course right, you do. You just do kid things, yeah, don't you? Of course but you do. I still had a table, and I remember a few times like playing on the table with my friends and stuff. But it all really started when I was seven. Uh, my gran, she took me around about four or five snooker clubs to try to get me a membership, and we finally felt we finally got to Spencer's and Sterling. And uh, I managed to get a membership in there because everywhere else I was too young. But uh, in Spencer's, they had a, a snooker league that we never knew about until we, we got in. And then every weekend, there was like 60 kids, all, about four different leagues. Oh, it was 80 kids because there was 20 kids yeah, in each yeah, league. Yeah. And every Sunday, there was a, a league on and then they would have a tournament. And that, that's where I, f I know most of my friends to this day still, you know, from, wow. from back then. And for seven up to I was 16 that's where I played through in Spencer's and Stirling and it was like you'd play once or twice during the week because they used to do coaching and then uh, Billy Stadden okay, used to do yeah, the coaching Billy. in there and then come the Sunday that's when you had your tournaments and then 
come the end of the season, they would have a big presentation night, which was brilliant because everybody was there. You were getting trophies. You had guys like Stephen Hendry, John Higgins, like dishing out these trophies, and it was brilliant. That's good, and especially at that age, you think that that's that's the people your peers in. Oh. You're getting trophies for them. It, it kickstarts you. Yeah, it's kind but, of mad. See, see that age though, when you yeah, were seven. Yeah. Right. How did you actually play in the table? Oh. A wee crate or something like that. Oh, yeah. At that age, when you were seven, or were you tall enough? I think I was okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah, used, were okay I, used, yeah. I used to rest a lot. Yeah, a lot, yeah. <laughs> ah, exactly, yeah. yeah. But the rest was my best friend. I should have just kept that instead of a queue. <laughs> but yeah. uh, it was I, still a bit of a blur, but I don't, don't remember standing in a crate back then. Because there was crates around the table, Yeah. but I don't remember standing in a crate. But I remember joining the league, and I hit the ground running, because it was Division 4. And he... Uh, I end up winning it without losing a match, which I'm thinking about it now. I was like, wow. I, I never played. Is that when you were seven? When I was seven, yeah, I was like, I never played any. Would you call it like on a full size table a lot before until then, and I just hit the ground. I was like natural. Natural. So I, what kind of breaks were you were you doing? I was probably when you doing were seven. About twenties to forties kind of yeah. thing, you know. That's and it, <laughs> no, I'd love to put a ball on a table. I remember there was a New Year night. Uh, like, like Hogman Eight Night that they, they, they had, and my mum was in there, and, and all her friends, and we were all just playing snooker mm-hmm. like any other time because we loved it. And I remember I was do, I was on a sixty odd break, and I actually went to the toilet to wash my hands because I was buzzing, you know. And that, I, I remember that because that was like my first kind of big break. Wow! And then it's just kind of year after year get you get better and get better, you know. So no, so really, it really started when I was seven. Brilliant! Oh, thanks, your gran. My gran, hi, exactly. Yeah. My gran and my gran and granda used to take me as well, and my mum as well. I was like, they seen it like how much I loved it, That's because it. and then it just took over. It just took over everything I kind of thought about was snooker, 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 you know. And it was good because it taught you a wee bit of etiquette, mm-hmm, you know. I've and it taught that. your counting. You obviously had to count to to mark up your scores and stuff like that. And obviously, they, I made a lot of friends through through, through there that I still talk to these days, yeah. you know, and it's amazing. It's, I wouldn't have changed it for the world. No. So you stayed in that, that, that snooker venue at Spencer's from 7 till 16, basically, Six, yeah? 16, and I yeah. moved to Glasgow. My mum moved to Glasgow, so we moved to Glasgow. And uh, But I was in Glasgow most weekends as well because my family had shops in Glasgow and my, my gran and granda and my mum, they were from Glasgow. Uh, so I knew a lot of people in Glasgow and I was quite lucky because... We moved to the Craig Park Masters, well, close to the Craig Park Masters, and that's where I managed to get a deal in with them to get free time. So we helped brush the tables and stuff, and I got free time. Uh, so that was a big move, but I knew I was lucky that I knew people there, uh, and I, that's what they kind of welcomed me. And it's just the friends for life now, you know. It's, it's like we're all cut for the same cloth, mm-hmm. so yeah. you kind of all think the yeah. same. You all yeah. kind of. You've all got your own traits, but you're all deep just down. Clicking. Oh, yep. aye, it's just the same kind of people. So it was like it's just a home for home. Yeah, Good. brilliant. So at age when you kind of what age did you think, or I want to be a snooker player? What age were you when you were thinking? Oh, did they click? Kind of this is this is this, this is what I do full me. time. Well, that's, when I was seven, that's what I wanted to be. Right, right, right that's okay. what you always say. That, what do you want to play? Aye. Your words were snooker player. Aye, that's what I wanted to be. Even when I was at well, fifth year at school, I actually done half a fifth year. And then I went, no, I saw this. I just went <laughs> down to the club and started practising every day. Because you practised with Hendry, Billy Snadden, there's Marco Fu. Wow. That was that sweater shop Amazing. crowd for yep. B and Doyle that was that was in Spencer's. So you're practising in, in with these guys, you know, and Stephen Maguire, you know. So and look, at, look at the guys there. They're, they're, they've all the best, mm-hmm. been the best in the world at yeah. some point near enough. Eh? So eh, that's what I wanted to be. But then when I moved to Glasgow... I thought Stan Spencer's was more professional, even though the Masters was brilliant and it was the, probably the best club in in Scotland for how it was maintained with Tony and Linda, mm-hmm. uh, Linda Smith. Uh, the Masters was a brilliant club, but the crowd I hung about with was more of a bit of carry on, you know. It was more of having a laugh and yeah. being serious. As you know? as they usually. Aye, so my game kind of kinda went. Downhill a wee bit. <laughs> Your social life went up. Uh, social, yeah. social life was brilliant. You know, especially when I turned 18 and you could get into the nightclubs, you. you know. A wee beer. Uh, just a wee beer. <laughs> uh, 
but we'll not mention the other bees. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But uh, it was a. Uh, so it was a crowd, but it was. Uh, part of Billy said, to, Billy Snadden said to me, "Say that was the worst thing you could have done. Was move to Glasgow. You should have stayed in Spencer's, and you'd have you'd have done better." But I got better life skills when I moved to Glasgow because I was a quiet wee boy coming for Danny, Danny, right. mm-hmm. called Danny Pace next to Danny. So I was really quiet. All we kind of all we done was play football, golf, and then played snooker. Mm-hmm. When I went to the club, I never really done anything else, and so that's that's really how quiet I was, you know. And I would never talk to girls and stuff like that, so I was really quiet in my shell. But when I moved to Glasgow, my kind of eyes lit up, you know. It was like, wow, this is but in the big city, ah, this is the big like, well, exactly compared to a place called Dunny yeah. Pace, where there's like twenty houses, you know. But. Uh, and then especially the crowd that you were kind of hanging about as well, they bring you your shell, oh. you, uh, 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 if you're really pal away, a, a group of new people, that, that right. obviously you're still pal away now, you said. So oh. that, that allows you to come out your shell and your personality come out yep. a wee bit more. So yep. that was good, Danny. They've they, they done that, plus they obviously taught me a, a lot of bad habits too. <laughs> yeah, I bet you, I bet you, I bet you. But, uh, no, I wouldn't have changed it for the world, and then I started working. I got a few jobs, well, I always worked since I was like 16, mm. like helping the family out with the shops. And then I got a job in JDs, but I only lasted about three months through that. <laughs> Selling trainers, you know, but uh, you had to start somewhere. Yes, of course but it did. It was good. I had a, a, a good laugh with, with the people in there. But then I got a job with the Royal Mail. So I was kind of doing, I was in the sorting office. So I worked there for about six, seven years. Right. Uh, but that's when I kind of, when I was earning money, then it was a case of, I would rather go and enjoy myself mm-hmm. and the snooker did go downhill, downhill I, mean, I kind of fell away from it because it was like the nightlife and your friends were all going out so you started going out and it just it what took over a bit that's and then you're working happens. and then your snooker fell away because back then there wasn't a lot of snooker tournaments because I remember it was like the pros were okay they had like about eight tournaments a year but you couldn't get into them you had to qualify into right. them and Scottish snooker back then they had two associations and they were both fighting with each other. So they, the both of them got banned for like uh, sending players to the big tournaments like the World Amateurs or European Amateurs. So there was kind of no door to get in. Right. You know, so it was like that kind of, the only other door you had was, uh, what was it? It was, uh, I can't remember the name. It was, it wasn't the Q School, but it is now. Right. It was like, a wee tour that they had but even then I was still too a bit young to understand you know a bit immature so I just kind of fell away for it a wee bit and it wasn't until I was 25 How long did so you, you fall away for it? Oh, that's, that's what I was thinking fight. that's a well, long time I fell away for I was about 18 Right 18, 19 till I was 25 wow. I never, never played at all and then I moved back to be my mum in Cumbernauld because I kind of woke up and like hey, I need to sort my life out you know, I was like, because you're just living for the week. Of course you, you know? yeah. Of course we all right, done that, it. That, that, that age, was that. You're living for the weekend. Week. Uh, so. It was the weekend start at living for the during the week well, as well. Well, that's <laughs> the thing. Late in Monday, the Monday clubs. That had, you, that's that started getting worrying. You had, you had trash on a Tuesday. You had privilege on a Thursday. Friday you had the tunnel. Saturday you had yep. the tunnel. And then you had Vic- Victoria's on the Sunday. Wow. You know, so you were sorted. But how did you afford it back then? No. No. Exactly, that's the last we were the same, the Mercury Bed, Thursday, Friday, borrow, Saturday. Aye, yeah. aye, aye. Aye. Probably me more, probably more money back then, aye, by the way. I'll tell you. It's crazy. Unbelievable, but, unbelievable. Uh, so, w- when you fell away, f- what, what made you get back into it? Was that that realisation back at your mum's going, I need to sort something out, what am I going to do? Well, I was still, once I moved back to my mum's in Cumbernauld, there's a, there was a snooker club, basically five minutes walk for the house. Right, it's so, good. I took a walk up one Sunday night. I was like, I'll go up for a wee hat. So I went up, got a table in the corner, just myself, just had a wee hat, and uh, looked over, and there was a crowd over on the other side. I was like, I kept looking over, I was like, do I know anybody? And then I, I noticed a couple of wee faces, I, I think I know him. And then he turned round, and, and it was a guy called Gary Hendry, and I knew him for Spencer's, because mm-hmm. he used to do... Way back. Uh, they used to do tournaments on a Wednesday, like a flyer, and you would get all the Cumbernauld boys coming or the Glasgow mm-hmm. or, or the locals playing in it so I knew him for then so he came over he's like Marky I was like wow and then he's like I was like what brings you in and he's like oh there's tournaments tonight and he's like we play we, we all play here on a Sunday night 
he says, do you want to come in it? I was like, aye, fire me in. Yes. And then for that day, I got back in there and I was hooked again. And that year, I won the Scottish, finished num- I won the Scottish Championships, finished number one, and I, then that invited me to the World Amateurs, mm-hmm. and I got beaten in the final of that. So that made me turn pro. Right. So it was the space of like under a year. Months, I, months for no playing, wow, what, for no seven players. years, six years, seven yep. years, to then becoming pro. pro and, 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 and that pro status then was you're in the top 96 in the world because there was only 96 pros. Wow. So I'm sitting in the house like, how am I in the top 96 <laughs> in the whole wide world? So you start overthinking, you know, but, and then I'm turning up to tournaments thinking, well, I'm part of this, you know, and I'm actually saying, oh, thank to the referees, thanks for refing my game. Where I'm like overawed. <laughs> no, no, like, you're the man. I, I'm <laughs> so, I, I came in and I'm, I'm playing like, oh, well, look at Judd Trump. So it was me and Judd Trump. We were in the first rounds with Mark Allen, you know. So you, these are the guys I was up against. Back then, they were like, they were the best of the best mm-hmm. in my eyes. Mm-hmm. So look at them now. But so that was the guys I was up against. So I'm sitting there like that. And we're having a good chat and stuff like that and so I'm in awe of these guys instead of thinking about my game and, and doing me I'm too busy enjoying the, the whole the experience the whole experience, the whole experience yeah, yeah so yeah. and then the second time I was on I kind of done a wee bit better but it was hard because that year I fell off because I was I was useless I think I won one or two games after that uh, out of six tournaments right so I fell off and had to do it again I'd, you had to Finished number one in Scotland. Yeah, in the amateurs, yeah. Yeah, in the amateurs. So I got lucky. Come the last event, I had to win the Scottish. Mm-hmm. And Anthony McGill, who it was between me and him, he was sitting mm-hmm. number one and going into the Scottish. He had to get to the final if I got to the final too. But he got beat 6 5 in the semis. So it means I had to win the final. To turn to finish to number Trogan. one and yeah, end up yeah. winning seven nothing. I played brilliant, brilliant, and he uh, won seven nothing. Who did you play in that final, mate? Oh, it was a uh, boy for Edinburgh. You've got me there. Uh, I've got. Oh, what's his name again? Seven nothing. He gets spanked anyway. They get spanked seven. <laughs> good, good player. <laughs> he's a brilliant player as well. Yeah. Oh, what's his name? He's got ginger hair. That narrows it down. <laughs> There's no Anthony Gill anyhow. No, no, no. He was sitting in his in his house pulling his hair out, probably. Yeah, <laughs> yeah oh, can't remember. That's all no, right, no, mate. That's yeah. fine. That's fine. So, and then that you got that that basically gave you the status of top ninety six again. Top, top ninety six yeah. again. Then I went on, and it was the same idea. It was like there was only seven tournaments that year, so. You had a tournament, then a couple of months off, then a tournament. You might have had two tournaments in one month and then a couple of months off right, again. Mm-hmm. So you never really felt like a player. And it came, I played Patrick Wallace in the UK at December time because I remember my mum had party shops and so it's cards. So mm-hmm. Christmas time's just a write-off. So And she opened up a new shop in, in Falkirk in the Howgate Centre. So you're writing a, sup- you're writing a proper shopping mall. Mm-hmm. So... I was busy, so we were Baby. doing 12 hour shifts every day and my mum said, she says, I said to my mum, I've got the UK Championships like next week and I've not played and she's like, well just go, you're in it, just go because otherwise if you don't go you get fined as well, so you, I think you get fined £250 wow. pound, well, back then for mm-hmm, not mm-hmm. playing, so I went, I went, I got smashed 9 nothing. I, I, I wouldn't even say I played really bad, I would say Patrick played well, mm-hmm. uh, so plus you hadn't been training nah, no training so I just went down for the break mm-hmm. to, to, to get away to work. get away <laughs> aye, aye, 12 aye, aye, that's it so uh, I managed to uh, I was a bit of a kick in the teeth but the best thing that ever happened was the draw for the Worlds came out in January for the World Championships qualifiers who did I get Patrick Wallace again that boy who just beat aye, you beat me right, nothing right. so I thought to myself right that's not going to happen again so I put the head down and I just pra- I, I got a good practice and they uh, ended up beating them ten seven and I was actually seven three down and all and one wow and one ten ten seven brilliant and then that after winning that game I I had to play Jimmy White in the next round if I beat Jimmy White I was staying on the tour and Jimmy White was off so it was between it was like a, a playoff that we were playing right, if I you. beat him he's off the tour if he beats me I'm off the tour. And they beat me 10-8. Oh. Uh, it was a great game though. He played really well. 
Gutter. But it was gutter. But he was an established snooker player at that time. This is you going back 10 years, you know, and look at him now, he's still playing well. Still playing good. You know, so... I played really well. There was a cu- couple of wee bits. And I only think I missed one easy ball at the whole match, and everything else I played really well. And, and then what happened went, after that, mate? After that, fell away. I fell away. I, I kind of went. Oh, it was so hard to get back on the tour, and I played. I, pl- I actually played. Went back to the amateurs, right? And I played one event, and the tables were terrible. And I just went, nah, it's not for me anymore. And I started playing a bit more pool at that point as well. So. I enjoyed pool, but I thought pool was more fun, mm. relaxing, and you can you can have a, a and you can enjoy it better. Yeah, snooker, no snooker's quite serious, you know, so you're kind of scared to make a noise in the snooker mm, room. No, you know, no, I, I was saying that we were saying that before the podcast. Aye. We were talking about the atmosphere that that, that you're getting. The pool is night yeah, and day, it's night and day, uh, night and day. It's, it's like a football atmosphere. That's near what the, I, I, you know, Mark, that was the first I'd watched was your game, and I was like, wow, look at that, aye. and the, the crowds go, and you're right. Like the pool table's there yeah. and the fans are here. Aye. It must be. Oh wow! Aye. Yeah, it look, it looked amazing. Aye, you can't, looked you amazing. can't, you can't beat that. So I thought, and and then I met Stephen Stephen Allison. He had a club in Falkirk, so I just went in there for a hit, just the exact same when I went into the triangle for a hit. I, I got talking to Stephen. Any pennies? No, uh, no, uh, no. Uh, he just he. I uh, don't think he had pennies at that point. What's pennies? Sorry, pe- pe- it used to be a bar that that Stephen used to own. Right. Okay. I, this was before then because Penny's was it's right next to Falkirk College, well the old Falkirk, well, old Falkirk College, and uh, it was big for in the uh, Falkirk area for mm, pool. Mm. That's where everybody played really. But Santa, his nickname Santa, sorry Stephen Allison, he uh, opened a club in Camelin in Falkirk called the Corner Pocket. Right. So it was a new club, and I was ah oh, we'll, we'll go up and have a look. Went in, had a hit. Tables were brilliant. Everything was like spot on. So and I, I loved it because I did like the pool. I, pl- yes. I, I played a wee bit of pool in between, like just helping a couple of friends out with, with league games. So mm-hmm. I enjoyed it. And then there was a boy playing, uh, Stephen Campbell, and he says, do you want a game for money? I went, I no bother. So we, we play, end up playing for £100 and I never missed a ball <laughs> against him. <And laughs> That's then, enormous money in the table. Was that first day 10? No, it was first day 20, I think. 20, we played yeah. 20. And they... Uh, I could see Stephen Allison watching. Uh, watching St- uh, Steed's dad, who's called Steed as well. Uh, he was watching, and you could actually see them rubbing their hands a lot. This is brilliant. <laughs> this we can make a fortune at this boy, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and they did. Uh, that's that's how they started playing a few money matches, like big, well, bigger money matches uh, against a few. So when was that, mate? What, what year was that? Two thousand when you started playing the pool. What about? Now you're asking a question. 2000. Well, I chucked the snooker 12, 11 years ago it was now. So about 11 years ago. So you're talking about 2011? 11, uh, yeah. roughly. Here or there about. So and you it. just had that instant buzz oh, with a pool. I love a pool, eh? I, you, can yeah. see, you can see uh, your eyes and yeah, your spirit. It. Yeah. It's just the whole, the rigmarole about it, you know, it's like... It's like as a, 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 a good buzz. He's he's the same. Yeah. He comes same buzzing for I days. Yeah, that's just what he talks about. Yeah. 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 No, when I played pool years ago, but I mean nothing to no, I mean to a high standard. But I just loved playing pool and especially watching it. It's just the environment, it's just, eh? And it's, yeah. It's because it's quick. It's uh, is it, It's quick, isn't it? They've changed the rules to a, a set of rules called black ball rules. Right. What are and they? It's just more attacking. It right. means it means you've got to hit a cushion. You basically got to go for your shots. It means uh, there's no, no fudgy. You're, right. you're not fudging, so you're not getting tippy tappy snookers all the time. Right. You know, so it's a case of you break the balls, and nine times out of ten you're going for a finish. So, and if the boy doesn't get it, the other boy's clearing up behind. You know, so it is really attacking. It means if you say if you cover a bag, say you put a yellow over the bag and mm-hmm. I'm reds, mm-hmm. I can hit my red, I can pop my red, and then knock your yellow in as well. And it's not a foul. It's not a foul as long as I pop my head. So it's just about keeping the the game moving keep, fast, keep fast, it, fast. Yeah, Colour skill shot. Yeah, I like that. Skill, well, yeah. the skill shot is if the yellow's over the bag, I hit my red onto your yellow. Your yellow goes in first, and then my red follows it in. That's a, a skill a, shot. Yes, yeah, skill shot. So it's a case of it's, it's a brave shot to take because if you don't get it, then you're going to lose the frame. Because because mm. if you give two shots away now, 
Does it's a case of yeah. you lose the frame. That, that's it. Yeah, done yeah, you yeah. as well. Yeah. Just but that standard, the standard that Matt plays to, it's just. I mean, the players he plays against when it comes to for money is the top, 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 top pool players. I mean, Matt yeah. doesn't get an easy game. No, 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 no. And is there a time? So if, when you hit a shot, these have to play a shot. Have you only got a level of time before you have to play your next shot? They've started bringing have that they in, that? in that? tournaments. Right. There's tournaments out there where yeah, the sta <clears throat> standard's 30 seconds. Right. You've got to play within 30 seconds. And there's some tournaments out there that's 15 seconds, you know. So it's that's designed for the telly because... Sometimes I've noticed myself and it helps you as a player because sometimes you can start overthinking and walk around the table and you you know the shot. So but that that just you end up doubting yourself the more you walk around the table. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it can be to compose yourself. But in that instance with having the shot clock, it speeds you up a wee bit. Of I just mean just go for your shot, just be confident, just go for it. And uh, but the 15 seconds can make you look silly sometimes, you know. Mm. You've got to run yeah, round the quick. table. Yeah, I'm with you, I'm with you. Because you've got to check angles sometimes and you don't get a chance to, so it just, it can become a car crash. I'm with so, you sometimes, you're just hitting a shot for hitting a shot's I, sake. I just for, cause, because yeah, of the clock. Yeah, because yep, yep, yep. you, you wouldn't get that at snooker of the World Championships, mm -hmm. you know, so sometimes it can be a bit silly. So I think 30 to 40 seconds is, is good, you know, because then, then you don't get... If you're watching somebody that's taking a minute, two minutes a shot, who wants to watch no. that? It's, it's, you want, and that's what makes it exciting is the fast pace, the yeah. atmosphere. Mm. Well, just look at the darts. The darts is like that. No, that's, pace. What, that's yeah. what it you reminded me. That's what it reminded me when I heard the atmosphere. And, and so where were you on Saturday? Uh, Sunderland. Sun Sunderland. Sunderland, Washington. Yep, and uh, the Sky Lounge. It was uh, basically... The Lions Den. That was <laughs> unreal in there. You know? yeah. Aye, there was, the atmosphere uh, was... There must have been about... Up to 500 people. Uh, it was tickets only yeah. and uh, it was basically sold out sold in a day. Do you know if it was just names? They, they, they took names in. Uh, it was 400, I think, 400 people. 400 yeah, tickets like they had yeah. and it was sold out within a day. Like, Aye, amazing. It was, it was, it was, it was, it it was good. It was funny when I came out. I, I not came out like that, but I came, <laughs> I came out to, to practice, right, when they... You get a five minute practice before the match. So I came out and they were all in full voice. And no, that way I just said to myself, right, don't look nervous. Just don't look nervous because they'll, they'll, they'll see that. Just come out, just feel calm and go out. And that way I, I've put my case down on the table and I've lifted my cue and I've looked up and they're just all looking at me and I've just burst out laughing. <laughs> <laughs> I, burst, I burst out laughing and I just thought, ah, oh, that's because I, I just felt calm. I just thought, ah, oh, that's it. But no, nothing can get to me now they can do whatever they want yeah. that's me I'm, and that was you that was but it. it's like an event because obviously you have the walking music so Mark has his own walking music obviously the, the player that he was playing last Saturday he has his own yeah, walk on walk music, music that kind of stuff so it's just it's an, like event, an event it's like a and it just kind of the atmosphere right. builds yeah. and builds yeah. and builds yeah know. because Brilliant. they opened the doors that morning at 8 o'clock in the morning wow and there was when I went in, I was in there at about 10 for a practice and there must have been easy 50 people in there at that point. Uh, and the match didn't start to half two. 2.30? Wow, half you two. can feel that. I was building, building and building and building. building. I, I, yeah, I, yeah. I was a great day. I, I day, see when it comes to pool, money matches are the ones that you want to play in because it's a one table set up. You can't hide anywhere. Everything's out there in the open, you know. So you can't, if you're in a tournament, you can be in a table in the corner. You know, and a big shot's a big shot, but if it's in front of like 200 or 400 people, it's like a big, big well, shot, yes. you know? It's and even, even more pressure. I cause <laughs> even the wee shot sometimes, you know, if you if you miss an easy ball, you'd sure hear about it, you know? So every, every ball counts. Out of all the kind of money matches or that you've played, Mark, right, what's been the kind of most rowdy atmosphere? Weekend there was rowdy. But only for about, I'd say about six, seven frames at the start, you know? And it fell away because I took that big lead. Because you took the big lead. Right. Kind of killed it a bit. Yep. I played. Well, from their, their, their side, obviously, you were playing away. It was down yep. in England, aye. so. Aye. Aye. I was thinking, I was like, just thinking, I'm Celtic at Ibrox. That's the yeah, way I'm playing. Yeah, just yeah. Keep, <laughs> keep the crowd quiet. You know, that's what you want to do. I played a boy called Craig Marsh down in uh, Neath in Wales. Mm. And uh, 
I was behind that whole match and it was just party central down there for them. And then it came to the end, I was like 27, 22 behind. And I just I just had a purple patch. And then before I know it was 29, 28 up. What you do you know? mean a purple patch? I played, played never, 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 missed, never, missed, I, the ball, never right? missed a ball away. Everything, everything just went my way. He had a couple of dry breaks. I think he missed one ball and had a few dry breaks and it just I just never missed a ball and it was like I swung the match round and then I ended up winning 31-29 I won. Wow. And uh, that was in the play, the place. I, I can imagine, imagine it. because I, you know what it's like when you're be, come behind aye. even a football game as aye, you said, aye. it's even better the the, the, the kind of the, the crowd gets all, all uh, animated and in, yeah, in, a lot better. In, in this place it was a uh, a pool hall just off the town centre. So it was basically a town centre with a door off the main street, down the stairs, and you're in a kind of underground pool hall, <laughs> right? It was summertime. It was roasting. Sweat. There was actually sweat dripping off the, the ceiling. ceiling. Right? Cause we thought there was about 500 <laughs> people in this club and uh, sweat coming off the ceiling. And I, and I had a white T-shirt on and there was brown dots all over it. Because of the nicotine on the ceiling, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Drop down on the white t-shirt. And, and the the funniest thing about it, uh, I had to wear a glove. So I, my friend uh, Stephen Campbell had to go to. He was telling the story on Sunday. Uh, was it? Did they, yeah. did they tell you? He had to go. It was at a joke shop. He, yeah. he went to like a fancy dress joke shop to get me a glove because you need it to be like a silky glove. Yeah, yeah. For your cue to slide because I couldn't cue. Because of the condensation of the club, my cue felt like a toffee apple. You know, <laughs> you're pulling the skin off your fingers. So I said, I need a glove. And I, so I got a glove. So that's what won me the game. The glove. The glove. The, the glove won me the game, aye. On so, the glove. Was uh, that when you were 27, 22 down? No, that was, I was right at the start of the game. Right at the start? Aye, oh, okay, I was like, this is getting worse in here. And it was like, just as well we got it. Because otherwise, I was like, I couldn't play. And uh, but that was I, f I always said to myself after that if I, winning that match, I said I can win anywhere now after winning that game because I had no right to win it the way the way the match went. But to be fair, it was like that was the best atmosphere down there because you can imagine all the the rowdy Welsh, you know, yeah, and yeah, it was it was jam packed. There was a good few snooker players there as well, like Matthew Stevens and Andrew Pageant, Michael White. They were all there, so it was good to see all them. So, and they they all fancied me to win because they like, oh, fancy the snooker player to win, like winding oh, Craig, wind, yes, winding yes. Craig up, you know. <coughs> but uh, oh, Craig, see, at the end of the day, the, see all the pool guys when it comes to whoever wins or loses, it's tough to take when you get beat because I've been there plenty of times myself. But you still you still handle it with a lot of respect, you know, and that's why I think pool's grown now because way back in the day, I don't think you got that. Level you know, of respect yeah, between players. Be, be, between players, they all held grudges against mm -hmm, each other. Mm -hmm. Well, now as obviously you want to see everybody do well, but you just want to see the game do better now. Yeah, and, yeah. The, and the game is going. And it looks like it as you were saying that it's growing levels every year. Yeah, obviously you always have rivalries and snooker. It's like same in pool. Yeah. I mean, the rivalry oh, and and the pool is Mark Boyle and Mark Fansworth. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no kind of blood, blood. Uh, bad, bad blood mm -hmm. them, but they respect each other yep. but there's always been that Seven. before he actually played the first because obviously he played twice yeah yeah right yeah. now um, <coughs> who won the first game out of Mark's won both both yeah. yeah home and away but the first at home was 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 more was, nip and tuck yeah, Mark was, won 31 29 I was behind in that one a few times like five frames behind a, a good two or three times so I've kind of uh, I've kind of pulled out the bag a wee bit. <laughs> Good. The brakes turned a wee bit at the end where Mark's kind of dried up and mine started working. But over the course, you kind of find that happens. You know, like your brakes, you'll get go through good patches where you you you'll get balls all the time, and then next minute they'll dry up, and you've had five dry brakes. You know that like, that could that could easily swing eight frame eight yeah. frames to the opponent. You know, if you have four or five brakes that are dry, so. Mark, after the match there at the weekend, Mark said to me, he says, I let you off the hook at the home game. I, I've got uh, no, no issues with this match because you played it a lot better mm -hmm. than me. But the one in Falkirk, I should have won that because I was obviously, I kind of switched off a few times. But I wasn't going to say, well, you shouldn't have switched off. Yeah, no, well, it's not that. <laughs> but, obviously, it has, it has yeah. break dried up at yeah. the end. 
That's what happened, and I got the wee runs at the end, you yeah. know, which which you need. Which wins you the games? Because pull, that's a good thing about pull. It's about the break, and the break can decide matches, especially if it's first to five, six, sevens. Breaks are so important, and a lot of it is obviously if you hit the balls well, you deserve a ball. But sometimes you can hit them well, and they don't go in, <laughs> or. If you get a ball, they can go all scrappy, you know. So the breaks have got a lot to answer for, and that's what makes it really exciting. So because you can't tell when it's two top players, it's like a toss of a coin. It's all down to the break. Yeah, that's yeah. How many? In fact, in 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 Saturday, see see after the game, me and Santa, right? We went back to the hotel to get some tea because we were starving. Uh, how you left? Me? Right. Well, we left you for about an hour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, and obviously me and Santa were saying about your money matches, how many you've played in that kind of right, stuff. Yep. Right, so we kind of totaled it up, what you've played for. All right, right? okay. And you've played for half a million. No, I've no. Yeah, you have. <laughs> no chance. £500,000, mate. That's what you've played for in money. Wow. Right? Yeah, in money matches. Sorry, my bank looks nothing like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Probably minus. <laughs> yeah, wow. no, mate, that's, a lot that's, of money. Yeah, that's that's mad. When you wow. think about that, yeah, we were adding it up all your because you done you had a, you had two matches with Marshy, two matches with Ben Davis. So you did two. I had one with Ben. One with Ben. I had two with Tom. Two yeah, with, two, two with Tom with Mark, Cousins. Clint, I played Clint away. Yeah, that, that was another one, Clint. Like at the start, obviously get build that lead at the start and it quietens away crowd, but. Uh, that's crazy, half a million. Yeah, no, I don't t- and obviously you've played twice with, with Mark Farnsworth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what it is, mate. Yeah, yeah. Mad. But half well, a million. Oh, that's a lot of money. Pocket change on it. Yeah. Well, yeah, so mad. So mad, it don't it? Mm-hmm. So when, uh, obviously we're here, we're going to be speaking about Laura quite a bit, right, obviously. Okay, yeah. So when did you meet Laura during the, your, 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 your life? So we've heard Pool. When did she come in? She did came they? in 15, Bill. Just done oh, Bill, that'd be 15 and a, how do you call it, a half? No, well, nearly 16 years, 16. Bill. 16 years come next February, wow. it would have been. Wow. Uh, I met her at a snooker club when I was practising. Was it at that? So it was one of the pool, the snooker, yeah, so it must have been the snooker the days. The snooker, aye, because I was on the tour at the time. Right, right. And uh, it was the first time I was on the tour. The year I had a, a disaster. <laughs> 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 so she, she came into my life just after... There was one, it was a World Championships at the end, and that's when, it was just yeah, about two weeks before that I met her, because I remember she was watching the live score, because it was all live score then, on right, the internet yeah, regarding yeah. results, so she watched that, and I, I was a World Championships, I'm trying to remember who I was playing, I, oh, Andrew Higginson it was, I'm sure. Did you and win that for? No, no she eight. reached the trouble at patch. Uh, he got he got to the final of the Welsh Open the week before, and then they got beaten a decider for Neil Robertson. Mm-hmm. So that's the thing playing the qualifiers. We were down in Wales, right down in Prestatyn, and you're in a cubicle, and there's like ten ten seats at the end of the cubicle, and they're always empty. You're lucky if one person sits here, but because what Andrew Higginson done, we get into the final. It was packed. Same packed, 10 people, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it was like, because you're in the middle of nowhere down yeah, there, Yeah. Uh, and they beat me 10-6, but I was nipping tuck to about 6 each, and I missed a bad ball 7-6 down, and they kind of run away with at the end, so I was pleased with how the well I played, and I knew he was playing well, so I wasn't a, a disaster, but obviously I, I, was, I knew I was already off yes. the tour, yes. and then obviously met Laura, and then I, she kind of took over my mind then, you know, and we, we kind of, that was it. I met her in the, the, the Triangle in Cumbernauld. Uh, she knew one of my friends. Right. And her friend came into the snooker bit because she knew one of my friends. And then I was like, who's your friend? <laughs> you know, because I just noticed this blonde hair. Eh? I was like, nice, you know. So then um, we started talking the week after. And uh, I'm standing at, after talking, I'm standing at the stairs at the exit waiting for my friend coming out the toilet. And she's walked by me and she's went, because I've got my cue case in my hand and it's got stickers for like travelling. Mm-hmm. And she's went, nice stickers and walked by me. <laughs> you know, like that. Like, and she she said she was slapping her head when she got out the door. She said, imagine saying that. You know? Nice stickers. I know, nice stickers. So that was her <laughs> chat up line. It, what? Aye, that was it. So, and then I, I seen her, that, it was two weeks after it. I seen right. her in and then we started talking and then we kissed. And then I said to her, 
we fancy going like meeting up and we'll get a wee drink one night even though everybody's drinking that night you know but yes, I wasn't because I was I was being a good boy and practicing practicing so she says I will go and fancy what you doing Monday night and I'm like she's keen Monday night this is like Saturday so I says nothing will there was a beef eater in Cumbernauld so I says would you fancy going in the beef eater we'll just go there we had a wee drink in there and then from then on that was it that was it aye and then we were like we moved, we moved in with each other about three or four months later wow yeah quick yeah, I know but she she had a house well a, a flat and they were knocking the flat down you want down. to take out your mum's aye I know I was <laughs> back I, I was back so I had, I had money saved Let up me in. I know <laughs> after the beef eater he yeah. would get his rucksack I've got, I've got, I've got I'm your sorted, number bye. Yeah. so uh, what happened was uh, so I was saving up I was like I need to get my own place right because you can only stay with your mum for so long and Laura was getting moved, kicked, basically kicked out of her house. So she had to move back in with her mum. And I says, well, I'm going to start renting the house. And she's like, right, where about? And I says, don't know. Don't know Cumbernauld very well. So we've got a house in Neighbouring Hill. Just renting, like pri private rent. I think we're paying like £400 a month or whatever it was. So we got that, moved in, and everything's going all, all right. First weekend comes. I've drove down to the house. No, drove a taxi. I wasn't driving by back then. So... Got a taxi back to the house for the snooker on a Sunday night and the whole street's cornered off with the, the police. Apparently a guy got done in. Wow. Right? So the, the whole bit was cornered off, so I got into the house and I'm like, what's going on? She's like, I don't know, but the, the forensics are everywhere. It's like, all right. It's like, and then the next night, a car got torched. Wow, you just moved. Aye. <laughs> it's a good so, place. So Who like, picked that area? I, know, I said to her, I says, <laughs> where have you moved to, Baghdad? You know, she's like that. It's never like this down here. I'm like, oh, well, I said, we'll need to move. You know, we can't have this going no. on, you know, especially like, she, had a, she had a wee boy called Kai. So I'm like, ah, and he was only f three at the time. Right. Mm -hmm. So I went, nah, we need to move away from here. This is no, this is no good because you, you get a vibe right away. And uh, so we stayed there for about, I think it's about six months. It's hard to tell now. Oh, I'm too trying long. Trying to remember everything. Yeah, yeah. So I got a house and then moved over to uh, the other side of Cumbernauld and then we had a few houses, you know, because and it was uh, no, that was it. And then she started in a company called Scott's Parents, right? And she started in the accounts department, and she worked her way up in there. And then I was on the tour. I was still working at the Royal Mail. And then I got on the tour again. So I'd done that for a year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I was still working. I've always worked, even though I was on the tour. You said that, your mum's shop, yep, her yep, yep. constant working. Yep. And then what happened was, after I fell off the tour the second time, I was at, well, just before I fell off, I was at uh, the, Laura's work had a 25th anniversary, anniversary celebration at Glen Eagles. So it was all, everybody was invited to Glen Eagles. All the rooms were paid all the drink, everything was Class. all paid, so mm -hmm. it was amazing, eh? Beautiful, and I got, as well. Yeah, I, you were treated like royalty. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter if you had a, a million pound in the bank or a fiver, you, you, got, you got treated the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happened was I got speaking to the, the owner of the company, David Jackson, and he couldn't have been any nicer, and he was asking about the pool, and I said to him, I says, eh, sorry, the snooker, and I says, oh. I says, I'm getting to the stage now, I've got Marcus now, and... Snooker's no in a good place. Who's Marcus? The Marcus is, uh, he's the youngest. Right, okay. Right? So, well, Laura got pregnant. Yes. And then, so, it was basically a couple of years. So, uh, I said, I need to, obviously, I want to provide now because Snooker's no pain because there's only six tournaments a year. You've got to be in the top 64. And even if you're in the top 64, then you're only guaranteed about 14 or 16 thousand pounds a year. Fair enough, you offset every match you win, it kind of doubles yeah, up yeah, a wee bit. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I just thought, there's no money in snooker. Uh, and he's Especially a young family coming up, etc. Yeah. So I said to, David said to me, he says, we're moving into the new branch because they bought a new building and they were expanding. And he says, we've got positions opening up. I says, that's great. I'll, 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 I'll pop in with my CV and uh, I'll, be, I'll be good if, if there was any opportunities, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and he says, no, just come in. Come in. Because obviously, it must have took a wee shine to me. Because yeah, yeah. we're talking for ages. And then uh, I went in and basically I went in for an interview with another guy, Stevie, who ran the branch. And I thought it was an interview, but it was basically when he started. When you started, and, and, and that was it. Said. Brilliant. So I started as a storeman, and I now I've worked my way up to like an area sales manager. So I'm looking after like accounts like 
bars iron brew brilliant Bartlett so big accounts you know so it's like I've evolved at the same time I'm learning all the time you know mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. like I'm dealing with these big companies so it's Amazing. brilliant and it kind of I kind of took my eye off the snooker that way but then pools filled that gap because mm -hmm. snooker you've got to play all the time pool you can get away with it you can you can play once or twice a week and you and Laura worked together in there yeah we worked together and that was Mad. it Laura was she was in another building at, to start with in the old building and we were in the new building because she was in the gearbox centre she got moved into the gearbox centre so it was all big motors and gearboxes and uh, then they moved that section over to our building because they had to move a big workshop and stuff like that so that was a couple of years later and then we were in the same building so we worked together we were we just we done everything together mm. you know Amazing. we were inseparable and everybody seen it in the office how we reacted all the time and we would wind each other up but Brilliant. the love and all that was always there I love it she, love was, it. Your, she was your biggest supporter at, oh, the, she at was, the games uh, mate and the tour and when you were playing big, for the money matches oh, as well big time she, yeah, yeah she, very vocal and the thing is she hated snooker she didn't like snooker eh? she thought it, it was boring. boring she came to a few tournaments and she's like she's boring and the pool she loved the pool absolutely because she, she liked a drink and she mm -hmm. was full of fun you know and obviously the money matches are different because she know, knows the pressure that goes into that and she's under pressure too because <coughs> it's like a weight on your shoulders eh? and eh, so the whole occasion gets a bit much sometimes eh? but she supported me to the help she always, she always had my it. back eh? and eh, if anybody was to say something I'll she'd be like right on to them eh? right on to she'd them she'd be the oh, right. aye, your wee back up oh, your right hand woman aye, that's aye. Aye. she was my back up <laughs> aye. anything was going down she was in about it like Good. Uh, no taking any any crap. Absolutely brilliant, mate. But mate, see see when it comes to obviously it was speaking about Laura, right? And obviously she passed away this year. Mm -hmm. Right. But take us back to when Laura noticed something that wasn't kinda right. Right or was a miss. First of April. That was stuck with me forever. She found a... 2021? Yep. She found a lump, right, just basically above her nipple. When she came out of the shower, and she was like, feel that. And I was like, better get that checked. But didn't think it was anything bad, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. didn't think it was anything bad. So she got an appointment with the doctor, or well, the local GP. And they said, oh, looks okay, you know, but we'll, we'll send you for a referral at the hospital so we'll give you antibiotics just now because probably thinking it was a cyst or something mm -hmm. like that and because uh, it was only a young girl GP and uh, so but to be fair there's nothing much that they can do until you get it checked out checked. It's done, yeah. mm -hmm. so it was about six weeks four weeks six weeks later went to the hospital and this is during COVID mm -hmm. so I've had to sit in the foyer and Laura's went in to get an ultrasound Right, so she's so I'm sitting just I was like, I'll go and get a wee drink and I will read the paper. Two hours passed. And every person that came out that, that room or out that corridor, I was head up every time, like think, what's going on? You know, like surely she must be coming mm -hmm. out soon. Mm -hmm. And then a nurse came out and came over to me and went, Are you Mark? I was like, Aye, is everything okay? And she's went she's been given some bad news, she's very upset and I just knew there and then. So I've walked, Did you know it was cancer there and then, Mark? I didn't. We didn't. I didn't know. But no, but you I, knew something was. You had a hunch. I will, yeah. You get a lump and yeah. then you, somebody's in a bad way. You just you know. No, of course. So I went went into the. I walked into the car. I couldn't get to her quick enough. So I I think I actually knew where she was. You know mm -hmm. the way mm -hmm. I was walking because I was walking in front of the nurse, and uh, I've, I've I've got into the room and she was in bits, and I'm like, what's going on? And the, the nurse piped in and she says we think it's highly likely cancer but when she says when we actually tell you that it's like we're basically telling you it is but mm. we're not but we need to wait for the test results to come back so Laura had calmed down a wee bit you know because it's still early days you, of course. you don't know what type of cancer it is because with cancer there's a million so variants no, no. you know no, there's no. aggressive or there's no aggressive mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. it's it's a minefield no so we was sitting there thinking, right, and we're, we're listening, we're actually listening to this uh, girl from Marie Curie, and it's just going, 
it's going through your, it's going in and out your head. You know, all you thinking is the worst. You know, and that was the worst. And you don't hear anything you after don't, that. You don't, don't you? It's just your thoughts. No, that's all I can think. It's just I, your thoughts. I just here. remember her talking, and I didn't hear a word coming out her mouth. You know, all I'm doing is hugging Laura. You know, and that's all I could think about. Eh? So Laura had to get blood tests after it. So I went back out into the corridor, but a different side where it's quieter. So is this still on the same day, the two hours back out, yeah. right, Mark, we're going, right, okay, right. I'm with so, you. So it's still the same day, so Laura's got getting blood, so she's, so she says, I'll only be, we'll only be 10 minutes, so I went back out, sat outside, and that nurse that told us about the cancer, she's came out about five minutes later, and her eyes are bright red. And that, that's what, think. that's why I know now, because she's obviously known how bad it is for her to be like that because mm -hmm. she obviously does that on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. I know it must, it's hard for them, mm -hmm. right? Of course. But for her eyes to be like, I was like, no, she's no good. She's no good. So the test results and that came back and it was a cancer called, oh, tell you that, sorry, that night was the worst night ever when we got home. That was the worst night ever. We just cried all night at both of us, like cuddling each other. Just thinking the world, your no. world had ended, eh? You know, so a couple of weeks later, I got the results back, or 10 days later, I got the results back. That's for the bloods. Yeah, for the bloods, and it's basically declared the, the cancer's there. And it's a cancer called triple negative breast cancer. So it's basically Laura's like, it's the worst of the worst. Mm -hmm. But even like Laura saying that, I'm like, it's still early days, you've caught it early, because she did. Yeah. We caught it early, but at the start, it felt like the hospital was kind of dragging their heels with a lot of things, you know, because we went in, stepping up a couple of weeks here, it's like, we're ready to go in for an appointment to get told, right, we're starting chemotherapy, but the chemotherapy starts next week. But we went in that day, and the oncologist has turned around and said, no, I'll push you for a, a CT scan to, to get a proper picture of this cancer. Mm -hmm. So I've piped in and I've, I've said, we've come in here today, well, Laura's came in here today, we are fighting face on, mm -hmm. wanting to start this chemotherapy next week and you're wanting to delay it three weeks and you're saying this, uh, this is an aggressive cancer just for a scan. He's like, oh, but we need to find out the true extent of this cancer. So I says, right, I, I kind of get that. So why is it waited another two weeks, two to three weeks here for you to just do this? That's three weeks we've wasted. Now it's going to be another three weeks before we can start the chemotherapy. So you're giving that cancer time mm -hmm. to, to evolve grow and, and spread. Mm -hmm. Yep. And he says, we're putting you in for an emergency appointment. So I says, right, okay. I says, but how come, is it not standard procedure? If somebody gets diagnosed with cancer, you automatically put them in for a scan so you can get the full picture of it rather than guess or wait, you know? And they're like, no, that's not standard procedure. And I was like, that doesn't make sense. Somebody's got cancer, you would like to know where it is and what size it is or wherever All it is. information. Exactly. Of course you right do. away. Of course yeah. you do. Because you know it spreads and then, mm -hmm. well, we know at the end, once it spreads, that's you. So, she got the scan. It was, it was very quick. She got it. She got it like the Saturday after because we, we, we arranged a big party at the house for a like just a jeer up party. Yeah, like just all her friends get mm -hmm. her, get her morale up, ready, get the morale up, yeah, party energy up that for, she needs for, for this fight. For this fight, mm -hmm. that was it. So all our close friends came over. So it was about 30, 30, 30 people came over, 30, 40 people. And we had a great day, but Laura knew nothing about it. But then the day, the the day before it, so all these plans were in place for this party, and the day before it, she got a phone call: your scans tomorrow. And Laura's like that. Oh, but we've got, I was taking her out for lunch. I says, but we've got a lunch tomorrow. And I'm like, aye, but we can still do that and then go your scan, mm -hmm. you know? And she's like, oh, but it's ruining the day. I was like, we're looking forward to that day because we never really done mm -hmm. anything before that because of COVID. Because as things started to open up, back up a wee bit, like right. for that wee mm -hmm. stage mm -hmm. before all shut down again. Yeah. So we went, right, we, we said the... Uh, because she, she was worried, she's like, but I want to, we're, we're going somewhere nice, she says, but I want to wear my makeup and all that. And I says, well, phone the nurse and find out mm -hmm. if you can still be wearing your makeup and going for a scan. And 
she was allowed and she, and she actually went can I have a drink too <laughs> so she had, she was allowed to have a Prosecco mm-hmm. eh? so she had a wee Prosecco and that cause, so sh- we done that we went for a bite to eat and then she went for a scan and I says oh I need to go home and we'll get s- I'll get, I need to pick up uh, I forgot my I just said I forgot my wallet mm-hmm. uh, with my cards on it so went home and then that's when she's seen everybody at home and had a, had a great day you know so that kind of set her up for a fight and then we found out of the oncologist after the scans. So that's what I was going to say. So on the same day as the scan, Mark, did you just find out that day? No. No. No, it was another 10 days. Right, okay. A- everything was two weeks, 10 days, two weeks. Mm. Every- mm. Everything that was no, like... No, mm. and, and that's mental torture on its own. That, Tell me about it. <laughs> I, that's, that's like, that's every day, Laura, I, 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 that would... I, every time she had to wait for a test result, I, I would have broke mm-hmm. I, I, I would have broke me uh, Laura was she was the strongest person I've ever known amazing she, she was said that a few sh- times there was nothing that phased her eh? absolutely nothing whether it be work life or anything she had it she, she would never back down she that. never backed down for anything eh? and that's why she was like very independent you know and I, I loved that about her eh? and she would always tell you she would tell you how how it was, you know, mm-hmm. not, not in a bad way. She no, would tell yeah. you, go, she would just give her opinion, you know, and it wouldn't be in a bad, like, being negative about you. She would just be like, why would you do that? How did you, you not do this? Or mm-hmm. or my thoughts on this would be like that. You know, she would just tell you straight. But a lot of people don't like that in people. Mm. But So she rubbed a few people up the wrong way, but it wasn't in a bad way. But she made a hell of a lot of more friends, mm-hmm. that's for sure, mm, for, being, for being who for she being was. Real. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Absolutely. Like so, from the first of April to the first day of chemo, what was the gap between the first of April probably to the first? Eight, probably eight weeks. Is eight that weeks. On eight weeks, uh, and it's just a big eight week of worry because it's scan result, scan result after that. So you're talking about the start of June, then basically. Well, the scan at the, the scan at the start. I start of June. I've got it on. I had a wall planner up, and I had wow. it all, I had it all everything eh? I've still got it and know that way Laura couldn't look at it because I had everything to do with Laura was pink yeah you know like chemos or scans or everything and it was just the whole calendar was pink mm-hmm. and it was a case of that eh? at the start our first scan it showed that the, the lump was three centimetres mm-hmm. in the space of four weeks it jumped up to seven fuck me and that was a lump that was that was a the- lump aye it was a lump, it was it was like it would be thin at one end and then it would grow out. Mm-hmm. You know, so it was probably one centimetre that side and then two or three centimetres of that side, but it would be three centimetres long, mm-hmm. you know, and then it jumped up to seven in mm-hmm. the space of four weeks. Wow. You know? So then the oncologist was working to try and get this chemotherapy booked, but he was going for a special course that he was trying to get signed off. So he managed to get it signed off, and then she was, that was it. It was like uh, twelve sessions. So normally, it's all different kind of people can go in for. Sorry, eight, it was a. I'm trying to remember now, it was. Aye, that's what it is. Normal sessions are free and free, so you'll get free of one chemo and free of other chemo over like three week periods. Laura got four and four, but then. The second four that she got, that was every four week, eh, every three weeks, she had another chemo that runs side by side, but she had to get that every week. So that was like eight sessions. Wow. Am I counting that up right? Four and four and then the other one. No, no. Three and three and no, four sorry, and four. Four and four, so it's 12 sessions. 12. Mm-hmm. Sorry, 12. 12 sessions beside that one that she done four and four. And that's what the oncologist said. He says, you deserve a medal because... That's the most grueling and aggressive chemotherapy we've ever done on anybody in this Fort Valley Hospital. Wow. And that's when it hit me, I'm like, I just, that hurt me like a, a train. And I was, I burst, I probably burst out tears now. Because I just looked at Laura and she was just, how she was to, to what she was like, and she was fighting it and she never, she never moaned about anything, she just done it. Obviously, she found she don't, well. She did moan about obviously to to me a lot about like waiting on lots of like the results, results and stuff and like stuff. that. Yeah, but it was just 
the person she was to how frail and timid that she ended up, you know, you're like, ah, it's just, you wouldn't have a shot on anybody. So when the chemo, empowering, very empowering, um, from the point that, that, that she finishes our, our, our chemo, what was the prognosis then? Was it good or was it bad or, or the chemo never worked or? Halfway through the chemo, you could feel it, you, the lump was disappeared. It went so soft. It wasn't there. It just went soft, right. right? So they all said that was good. That's what I'd been thinking. Yeah. So we all thought that. So the second, after the second batch, it started to get hard again at the end because after she finished the chemo, it was another delay, like three, four weeks before the operation. Because you've got to let your body build up again because it just Strength. knocks your stuff in right out you. That stuff, because that, that can kill you. That chemotherapy could kill mm. you. So they done the first operation. They, they, they found out that with the scans at the end that, that it spread into her lymph nodes. Because Laura at the start, see right at the start, she turns around to her oncologist and just says, cut them both off. Wow. Don't need them. I can get mm -hmm. reconstruction, just mm -hmm. cut them off. I'm not going to take any chances. Mm -hmm. But they were pushing to go down the chemo because they, they thought if we can cut them, it might come back. But she's, they've pushed for the chemotherapy thinking if we can kill it with that, mm -hmm. then we know that we can, it's, we can, dead. it's, it's gone and it, it's not going to come back. But you can't guarantee that either. So in, my, in our eyes, mm -hmm. we're like, you're letting that, you're keeping that in your body. If you get it cut out, it's away. And after the chemotherapy was done, when she got her first operation, that's what the, the surgeon said. I remember it. She went, oh, at least it's out of you. At least it's out. I ended up 13 centimetres. And, and I'm like, ah, wow. could, you, could you not have done that at the start? Three to 13. You know, just cut out the start. And, and now you're saying it because it's cut out now. But I didn't want to, I just, we're just happy that she made it through the operation. No, exactly. And she got three lymph nodes out because the, the, the surgeon didn't know until she went in. She knew that th there was three infected at some point. And is this, lymph sorry, lymph sorry, is this the stuff in your throat, lymph they're, they're all over your are body. They all over your body? They're all over your body. They mm. basically, they swell up and fight an infection. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she got, the, the, the surgeon says, we don't know what's good until we get in there, but I can take out. And then she took out three, and then they test them. Mm. So she, the test results came back two or three weeks later, saying all the lymph nodes were still live. So we need to go back in and take out the rest of the lymph nodes. So after that operation, three weeks later, Laura's like, "I feel great. I feel I feel good today." I'm like, "That's good because that's how we worked it." I says, "You, I says, you get good days, bad days. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a bad day, we just deal with the bad day." Yeah. If you get good days, brilliant, happy days. That's good. So, and with the bad days, it was like, it was good because my work, Scott's parents, David and Tom, they backed us to the hilt. They mm. they took all the pressure off us. I've got to thank them because without them, the journey would have been a million times harder. Mm -hmm. And obviously all the support that we, we got was on, through the pool world was unreal. Brilliant. Because the work... David and Tom, they just says, just do what you need to do to me and Laura. Mm -hmm. The work will be here. Just use do what you need to do. We didn't need to worry about work at all. Obviously, we did still do a bit of work mm -hmm. to help of out. Of course, and it takes your mind away from you know, it sometimes, doesn't it? You need that. You, you need do. to keep yourself... Well, what i found out now, you need to keep yourself keep busy. busy. Mm -hmm. Keep busy. So, uh, so after that first operation, uh, so the three weeks, Laura's like, I feel good. I says, right, okay, we'll go into Falkirk and we'll do... We'll go and pick up some shopping because it was like a daily occurrence for me because she didn't know what to eat mm -hmm. every day she was like oh, you'd have a fridge full and you'd be like no, don't fancy that I fancy so and so mm -hmm. so I went well you end up throwing a lot of food out so I went right we'll just I'll shop every morning or every afternoon because there's a Sainsbury's two minutes away from the house so I just we just went like what do you want today so she would change all the time so it was a it was it got me out of the house for five ten minutes as well, you know, so I could I bet you. just get a bit of fresh air, mm -hmm. and then at least I knew Laura what she wanted to eat that day. So she we said, "We'll go into Falkirk," and she says, "I feel like driving today." And I says, "Fine, you drive." So she drove into Falkirk, and uh, I've turned in and I said to her, "Are you okay?" And she's like, "Yeah, I feel brilliant." 
I said, it's just a word. I don't know if can I swear or not. Mm-hmm. Of course you can. Course she you says, can. it's just a favourite word. It's shite. It's just shite that I've got to go in for an operation next week. You know, because I'm starting to feel good. And I says, well, think about it. Three weeks after this operation, you'll be back here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's your goal. You know, because I try to spin everything. And she went, eh, ah, you're right. So after that day, then she went and got the second operation. And then after that, she's just, she's never had the same energy levels after that. But the, the, the doctors just always said that's just side effects of the chemotherapy. It's just it's still in your body and it's still fighting away. You just can't be too hard on yourself. And plus you went through two massive operations, Operation. you know, so she, she just never had the same energy. So come start of February, it was, we were out for a bite to eat on the, on the Sunday. It was at this, the 6th, I think it was 6th of February. Out for a bite to eat. Took, we went to the escape in Glasgow. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. just get the wee man out of the house. We went to, like, he plays the arcades or the bowling. The, and uh, we'll go for a bite to eat. And she didn't even have the energy then. So we, we st- still went there. She was fine. She says, I'm fine to go because she, she like going out for a bite to eat because it got her out of the house as well. Of course. And I'm, I'm, we're in the arcade and I looked at her. She's sitting down at a game instead of playing something. I says, you okay? And she's like... It's just in the energy. He says, well, we'll just go home. So we went home. That night, she was feeling, she says, I don't feel right. I says, just take it easy. easy. Just just chill. He says, I'm here anyway, you know, whatever you need. And then the next morning, I've took Marcus to school. And every Monday, I went into work just to speak to my mm-hmm. boss and just say... This Tell him how the, things were. Aye, how yeah, I, aye, updating. He, aye, updating, plus... Checking emails, whatever. Aye, aye. <laughs> so... Went in there for a few hours and I knew Laura had to go to the Beatsons in Glasgow to get introduced into, because she was to start a radiotherapy on the 1st of March. So even that was a bit of a palaver again because she could only go in herself. So I've had to take her to the front door because I'm thinking as well. Cause it, I don't know how she done that COVID, herself. I, she, don't, absolute, I don't know how folk done that during absolute, that time. absolute warrior, so she was. Why was that? Well, why did only like... Laura just go to that, that appointment that all, was that's that all COVID, COVID? No, was that so because of the, the COVID still that, yeah that, that's a cancer ward as well so yeah. it's like that's high like yeah high in case priority. people had yeah. COVID whatever because if yeah. somebody that's on chemo gets COVID yeah. It's, yeah. It's, no, it's, 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 mm-hmm. it's not good mm-hmm. no so and you don't want to have that guilt so I dropped her off at the mm-hmm. front door and I'm sitting in the car at the front door just waiting for it to come back out and she's like I've not been seen yet and this was about an hour and I says say to somebody and she's like I have I says, I says well they must be busy and she says I feel terrible I just feel awful and I'm like say to them say to them because you're in the right place maybe they'll take your bloods and they can find out what's wrong with you to make sure like because mm-hmm. obviously you've got to check your blood levels if anything's off especially when you've been on the chemo and you get an infection that's, that's serious yeah. uh, so she said to them the nurses and they just said phone NHS 24 after hours after GP hours because all they'll do is refer you to the GP mm-hmm. so we did and then we managed to get a hospital appointment that night so we're in there she got her bloods taken so we're just sitting just before she's getting her bloods taken just waiting in the hospital we're just, I'm just just talking and I'm like mm-hmm. I'm just chatting away oh what's your favourite food you know like just try to keep mm-hmm, her mind mm-hmm, active mm-hmm. what's your favourite colours pink and green and looked at me like you know all this you know because mm-hmm. she's no female but I'm just trying to keep her keep her mind going and uh, and that's why the pink and green came yeah. about you know I was like pff, last thing I was thinking it was going to be our funeral colours you know mm-hmm. or the colours I remember Laura way, but it will stick with me forever and and I, and that's when I noticed as well like when we're sitting there our eyes started getting yellow a wee bit the, the back end of her eyes and that's mm-hmm. the first I ever noticed it so she got her blood taken and we got the results about a couple of hours later and the doctors came in and he says, right, he says, you've definitely got an infection, borderline sepsis. So I was like, right, okay, at least we know it's something, you know, and it's no good, but we're in the right place. But your liver's not happy. We need to figure out what's going on with your liver. And then, so we're sitting there and we both looked at each other. No, that way, like, no, can he be? 
and then came back the next, well, two days later. That was the Monday night. So we're in the hospital. She's getting tests all the time. She's on strong antibiotics. And then come the Wednesday, that's when they've told her spread to spread to her liver. Your liver. And that's what she, she just broke down there. And I'm like, wow. Like, what did we do? What did we do? And then that night, Laura's sitting up in her bed. She's like, right, I can still get my radiotherapy. I can still get some more chemo. Surely I can get some more chemo because your body can take so much. And at worst, they can cut a bit out. So she's still sitting up in her bed, upbeat. And then she got told on the Thursday there was no treatment available. It just took over her whole liver. And she got told it's short term. So I'm like, I didn't want to ask in front of Laura. I was like, what's short term? So that night, Laura's got moved into a single a single room. And so I was like, right, it was about half ten, about half ten, eleven o'clock at night. I was like, right, I'm going to go home. And I'll go and get changed. And I'll, I'll come back first thing in the morning. Are you okay? And she's like, fine. Because she was getting a sleeping tablet that night. Because she was on really strong antibiotics. And so she got the sleeping tablet and that's when I left. Then she was like, I'm right, that's me going to sleep. So I was like, I'll see you in the morning. And I've walked over to the, the, re the wee reception bit in the ward. And I says, can you help me out, please? And she's went, yeah, what is it, Mark? And I went, I've been told with Laura it's short term. What am I looking at here? Is like so I can start planning things like because I'm thinking maybe months, years or whatever. Eh? Mm. She's like, Mark says I've been advised days. Wow. And I'm like, and I, and I said, I says what? And she's like, she went days. So so I was like, I had to. I, I just I says. I'm I'm not going anywhere. I says I need to be with Laura. I says I can't have her being herself. But I says I'm going home the now and I'll go and grab stuff so I don't I've got all my stuff, so I've got my everything I need here and Laura's got to change her clothes and stuff. So I went straight home because all my friends were coming over mm. that night as well and I met them outside my house and I says, I'm only here for five minutes, guys, I need to go back up and I've told them there and I've I've phoned Eileen that night, her mum too that night and told her. And I just went back up to the hospital and never left her side after that. I just I just couldn't get my head around it. So come the Friday, we were sitting there talking to the palliative care people. And they said a space had opened up in Strathcairn Hospice. And right away I was like, because the hospital was terrible to be in. It was just too much going on, too noisy. There was just... It was just not the place to be for somebody that's no. like what, what was going to happen, and then she got moved to there, and it was it was like the only uh, shining light of the whole thing was being in Strathcairn the way the, the way that she got treated, how calm and peaceful it was, and they looked after everybody, not just Laura, they looked after the whole family, you know, and they couldn't have done anything better. So she went to. Strath Karen to the Friday. hospice. Yep, she went on the Friday. On the Friday, yeah, she got basically an ambulance straight there. Because uh, they said it would have been in the afternoon, but within an hour there was an ambulance there. We were lucky, you know. And uh, she got, we, we just followed behind in the car. She was in the ambulance, like, uh, and we got there, and then she got settled in, and then we went in, and then she was still talking a wee bit. She knew, like, she would drink water and she had an ice lolly and stuff like that because her lips were drying up. And uh, she was still chatting away a wee bit. And then she was coming and going a wee bit because she was on a morphine. And then that night, her breathing changed a wee bit. She was getting heavier. And you could tell she was fighting it. Mm -hmm. She's fighting. And it was our anniversary. Her, her 15th anniversary on the Saturday the 12th and she's woke up Saturday morning and she's looked at me I'm sitting next to her in the room with her because I stayed over I was the only person to stay with mm. her that night and she's looked at me and went happy, happy 15th anniversary baby 
Das ist Probe. Schiebe es her. Schiebe es her. Schiebe es da auf. Da brennen wir es da auch gehen. Schiebe es her. Eine Ehe. Das ist halt dann. Ja, oder Hand oder Ode. Und einfach let it go. Aber sie hat auch vor allem weh. Und ich kann. Sie hält an, ich kann selber einen Brief an all das. Sie hält an. Sie hat eine Passion in der 12. Und ich kann mir. Der Sonntag morgen, sie passt da weh. Sonntag morgen. Fuck me, Mark. Ich kann sie auch schon fein, so sie hat einen Pass an weh. Und der 12. Ja. Sie was auch feier. Oh, Mark. Uh, uh. I thought this was meant to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, but this is what these podcasts are about. People, like, so many people are going through it. I'm going through a hard time now as well, Mark, the exact same thing. Well, not the exact same thing, but the, the, the cancer cut out my face. And when you said, when you mentioned there about when it could cut out the sense of relief, and they, when I got that operation last mm -hmm. week, straight away that feeling that you said that was it mm -hmm. and that was the first thing I thought when you said that because it's how it, it's the name it's the association with the name it's, it's in your body it's inside, it's inside you. you and when I get that cut out Mark I thought to myself straight away uh, a sense of relief that, that it, mm -hmm. it, it'd been away mm -hmm. it'd been away because it's the word the word demobilises people so much yeah. and that's what we're doing these podcasts for it's I know this is upsetting for us all mm -hmm. everybody here but people don't talk about this Mark people don't talk about the effect that it, it, it has on you or, or how you deal with the stress or, or like if this people listening the listeners that are listening to this that are going through the same topics we're going to help them mm -hmm. that's what this is about so yeah, it is meant to be fun, but it's serious, it's real, raw yep. and relevant, and that's exactly what it is. And this Mark, happens every day, every day in people's lives, I mean, that, that, that's, they're the facts. No, no. People deal with tragedy every day, every day, and it's just when young people die, and obviously Laura was only 36, so yep, she was when she passed away, mate, so it's, it's so young. It should not happen. No, it, should. it should not fucking happen at all. It's life. Yeah. Isn't it? So, she passed away in the, in the 13th, 13th yeah, yeah. Yeah. in the Sunday. Mm -hmm. Right. How'd you continue, Mark? How, how did you... How, how, yeah. Well, it keeps you going, mate. My boy. Marcus. Hey, Marcus, hi. If it wasn't for he's, Marcus, he's, he's if you'd have had Marcus. See if I'd have had Marcus, I honestly don't think I'd be here. No, did they thought, did suicidal thoughts cross your mind after it, Mark? No, really, no, no I, just, just... I just, I <coughs> just, <coughs> excuse me, they never passed my mind. More a feeling. I just thought, what's the point? Mm -hmm. I, I didn't think about doing anything. Mm -hmm, I just, because I knew I had... I had an amazing people around me. Mm -hmm. I had amazing support. I had basically to start. I had a, a funeral to plan, and that's <sighs> that's all I could think about is make it perfect. It's the last thing I can do for her, you know, is make it perfect. And I and I had so much going on outside that as well. I just thought, I just. Just planning everything, it was hard, but I had to keep strong for Marcus as well, well yeah. the kids, right, so of I had course. to keep strong, so it was a case of, I but uh, you're doing stuff that keeps keeps your mind active and keeps busy, luckily I didn't have to go into work or anything like that, because I, I couldn't focus on anything, but planning the funeral took up a lot of time and effort. And obviously, I think I hardly ate because I lost a lot of weight as mm -hmm. well, you know, so I wasn't eating, I had no appetite. I was just numb, absolutely numb. And 
if it wasn't just for the people around about me and to pick me up and try and push me back together again, it was like... Uh, it's hard to explain it. it was just, I just I just had to do what I had to do, really. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, had to, I had to try and just do what I had to do. And I, and I managed to just keep strong. But you had a wee party for Laura. You had uh, a, a, well, a, a, at the funeral, yeah. Uh, a wee disco I, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say a, like a yeah, party, a party but but I would say she, a celebration. Laura, a celebration, a celebration of life. Of her life, yeah. yeah. Because she's always said to me, I want I want it to be bright. <laughs> I want it to be bright. I don't want black doom, doom and gloom, you know. I want it to be bright. I want you to celebrate my life, Brilliant. you know. This was even before she got cancer. Which, and that, that, was, knew, that was just the that way she was, always that spoke. The way she, yeah, the way she yeah. was. Mm-hmm. Uh, she, she liked Daria. She always thought she was a mermaid. She liked mermaids and stuff like yeah, that. So yeah. she's like, I want to be, we'll, we'll get buried in that at Westfield. So we knew, we, we knew all that a few years ago, mm-hmm. you know, and it's a, uh, and then obviously she loves music. She absolutely loves music. And, and Danny sang for her that party that we had at the start. Right. And so Danny, it was only fitting. And I asked Danny and he, he says, not a problem. He says anything. He says it would be a privilege for me to do that. And he, he, he sang for a good hour or two at the funeral. And you could tell how hard it was for him as well, you know, to do that. Because you could hear it in his voice, you know. And it was it was, it was, was just amazing. The whole day, it, came, it worked out perfect. I couldn't, I couldn't have done any more. Or we couldn't have done because mm-hmm. I had all the support for the pool community, snooker and pool community, Brilliant. and and friends and family. You know, it was like it was all we all pulled in together to give her, but the least that the she deserves, de- the least that she deserved. You know, yeah. so and even the plot that she she got, it was like luck that we got the plot that she wanted. Well, no wanted, but it was facing area, the big statue just off the motorway in Cumbernauld. Mm-hmm. So. Because I was like, oh no, what happens if it's facing away? I don't know, mm. you know, all these mm-hmm. stupid things that pop into your head. But she was lucky and got, got one that face, faced Aria. So I, I hugged the grave digger that day when I went down to see the plot because he, he already said, to, I says, is there any chance we can pick a plot? So I know it's facing and he's like, it's already been picked. And the way it was working out obviously goes in order, you know, so and I'm like, oh no. Where it is now, it's facing away. But they'd picked up a plot that was left, that had been missed out for some reason. I don't know why. It was like... Because they asked me, they says, is Laura a big girl? And I went, no. She's like, she's tiny, you know? <laughs> she says, it's all right, because the size of like, the coffin and stuff like that, it's like we've, we've been given sizes and we thought she was big. I was like, no, it's just a standard coffin. You know, like, no, it's, like, but it was a good, <laughs> a good coffin, you know, and... They went, all right, okay. And then, so it's worked out lucky. So somebody's probably made a mistake somewhere. Yes. You know, like a size a size or something. Cause a lot has been looking down and I, making sure that that plot well, was there for... She's, <laughs> she's done a lot of things, I'll tell you that. She's done a lot. There's been loads of signs. Oh, has there? Well, don't start on that. It freaks me out, that stuff. <laughs> there was wow. that many signs. I, I, I got a spiritualist over. Right, tell us about that. Got a recording on my phone about it because she let me record it right, and it was like, wow. Every she knew everything, absolutely everything. She knew about obviously Laura being Laura. Mm-hmm. She knew she loved singing. She knew she sat. She's shown me green and white flags. Wow. Was Celtic. She knew how we met. I said I've got a, a pool ball in my living. I took all the photos down and everything, and I've got a pool ball in the living room, underneath my telly. And it's signed with Ronnie when I played Ronnie that night, Ronnie O'Sullivan. And it's a, so it's a pool eight ball. She pointed to it and went snooker. Do you never, because you would say pool. Of course mm-hmm. you would. She went snooker. I'm like, ah, that's where you met. And she says she wasn't too fond of her chat up line. Nice stickers. So really? That's uh, right. Wow, wow. So crazy. So oh, was, oh I'm pure, I'm just, here's I, off my face. I'm just stood up there. Right. And she knew, knew about two boys. She knew about uh, the Aurora, the Northern Lights. She mm-hmm. knew about that. She knew about Loch Lomond. She said, mentioned Loch Lomond. She said that was her happy place next wow. to the water. Wow. So I'm like, right away. 
Loch Lomond, but I never said it. Right. And then mm-hmm. further down, she went, Loch Lomond was her happy place. Wow, like wow, wow. And uh, she met, she knew everything. She even knew. She turned around and says, Laura says thanks for your gifts that you put into her coffin. Wow. And she went, not, she went, she mentions key to the door. And I'm like, no, I said, stop. And she's like, how? I says, no. I, no. Nobody in the whole wide world knew I put her key in. And I says, that's always yours, baby. That's always yours. And wow, that's nobody crazy. in the world knew that. that. She knew everything, absolutely everything. And there's a lot of stuff going on, personal stuff, like with Laura's family and that. And she knew all about that. Wow. And she's basically just turned around and says, cut all ties. There you go. And and she also said, she says, Laura's always, will be always there for you, but she'll come back when it's your time. Uh, and I've got our, I've got our, uh, our blessing to move on and be happy. Amazing. And I'm like, and, there was a funny thing about it all. Everybody that was there last night, there were six other people, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody said the same about the readings, amazing. Everybody else got asked if there's anybody else you want to speak to. I never. I never got asked, right? And I know why. Because Laura would be up there the now saying, he's here for me. <laughs> Nobody else is getting a look in, so don't even ask. You know, <laughs> like or don't that. even pop your head in. Yes, She aye. would be like that, eh? A million percent. She's like, he's here for me and he's mine. Brilliant. You know? But, eh, so that... That gave me a lift. That's what I was going to say. How did that make you feel? Did, obviously, it just it just cemented <coughs> everything I thought. Right, good. Because I had thoughts going through my head with situations that have been happening. Mm-hmm, right, mm-hmm. you feel like you can do better, or I should have done. I, I'm not perfect. I'm far from it. Does. But my heart's in the right place. Yeah. And the way I see life, you want to enjoy life and do good things in life. But as long as you're not hurting, hurting anybody, that's then it. you're not doing anything wrong. So that's my kind of philosophy. Enjoy yourself, but as long as you're not hurting anybody, then you're not doing anything wrong. It's a great philosophy to have. Yeah. I'm yeah, all over absolutely. that. Absolutely. Mate, how did you get back to the pool after all that? Well, how the always, fuck did you she, get back? She always said to me, like, obviously, if anything does happen, I want you to be playing pool so then I can watch you play pool. Because she, she said, I want you. I says, I know how happy, I just want you to be happy. So, it was a month later, uh, I was like, right, I'll start, it was a Thursday, Thursday night, a month, a month later, I was like, right, the IPA tournament is in Coventry the week after, this, say the weekend, the, week, the next weekend after that. So I says, right, well, there's a Saltire tournament in Glasgow, this weekend coming, so this is the first day I was at, I'll go and play in it, and I'll get a couple of matches under my belt, and then that'll at least give me something going into next weekend, down down in Coventry. Turned up, and I was playing, playing a boy called Brian Cummins, mm-hmm. and he was in the Scotland A team at the time. After they just they just all won the Nations Cup, I think, the last time they played it, when he was in the team, so he's a great player. So I'm thinking to myself, a tough draw, to come back to just you know but I ended up winning I ended up beating them and I played played okay played I would say I played well mm-hmm. you know and uh, so that kind of gave me a wee lift and I was like right well it is still there mm-hmm. you know and every game I played I just got I just felt more comfortable and then come the Sunday I felt good on the Sunday <coughs> so it's got to the semi-finals and I'm playing Clint uh, Clint Ianson mm-hmm. from England <coughs> And it's got every round's first to seven. The semi finals it jumps up to eight. But I've totally forgot all about that. So Clint's won the frame to go seven five. So we've both walked up to each other and shook hands, thinking I was beat. And then the guys have shouted out, It's first to eight in the semi finals. Remember like that? I've looked round to the big screen and seen race to eight. I was like, mm-hmm. Oh, I was like, no luck. <laughs> that laughing, eh? I was like, so we're st- obviously it was my break, I broke and cleared up. Then Clint, it was his break. I think he had a wee chance, but it was a hard chance. And so I got back to the table, cleared up, decider. 
I broke and cleared up, ended up winning 8 7. And I was like, but she all the way through all day, I was like kind of talking to Laura. Well, yeah, I was like, like she'd be your side. I asked, it was a couple of times I said, right, come on, you help me out. I bet, you know? it was, bet it was seven Laura made it eight, I, eight frames. I know, she's changed the, <laughs> sco- she changed she changed the, the scoreboard. <laughs> and, then, and then in the final I played, I was playing my, my good friend, Ross Fernie. And I was like, it must have been tough for him because everybody was really wanting me to win mm. because obviously everything yeah, that's everything happened. happened. And then luckily enough, everything went my way again and I won. And honestly, I must have been a million to one shot to win that tournament. And uh, so it was written in the stars. She was looking brilliant. So oh, wait. And then from there you went down to Coventry, yeah? That well, was the following week? That was the following week, yeah. yeah. So I gave me a wee bit of confidence. Good. So I played Liam. And what was that? No, it wasn't Co- It was Coventry, but I'm trying to remember because I played... No, that's right. I'm trying to remember who I played because there's two events you play and I lost in one of the, the first one I played and then the second one was the Open. The one that Laura says that's the one to win because everybody's in it. Because you get an amateur, a pro, and an open. Mm-hmm. So the, the open amateurs and all the pros are in it as well. So she's like, always like, that's the one you want to win because all the players are in it. So I managed to win that on the Sunday with the wee man beside me. So he wee came Marcus, over. Yeah. Aye, wee Marcus, I So he's came over, lifted, lifted the trophy. You couldn't have it. I was written in the stars, eh? Absolutely. You, yeah. Just the way the, I played well all, all day. And then straight after the match... I was taking Marcus to London eh, to go and do because I had a day off work on the Monday so I was like we'll go and do the tour of London because he's always said I'd like to go to London mm-hmm. and Coventry's only about an hour away so we drove down to London that night and we were staying at eh, Wembley Stadium the, the hotel right next to it was mm-hmm. the Premier Inn right next to eh, Wembley so he's standing there and he's got the trophy outside Wembley like that it. and that'll live, live with me forever eh Amazing. And they had the best time down in London. And the highlight of London, we'd done it all. The big wee, uh, London Eye and everything, everything yeah. the bus tours. And the highlight was hiring the wee two pound bikes and going down, what do you call it? The mall. Going right, down the yeah. mall. And I'm behind them. And I've got my phone and I've took a picture of them. And I was like, who'd have thought this, this wee guy's world had crumbled, you know? And he's loving life on a bike, going down the mall and Buckingham Palace in the back. Obviously, he was just at least took his mind off it for, of course. you know. And and for that day, I says, I I've got to got to make sure he's fine. And that yeah. was you. That gave you your strength. Yeah, but that's gave me my strength. And everybody, everybody about me, the way I see it, I've, obviously. I've been called like an inspiration and stuff like that. I'm far from it. I'm f- I'm I'm just like everybody else. I'm just lucky I've had the support there. Mm-hmm. So in my eyes, everybody that's helped me has had a bit of magic, a, a piece of me, and just put me all back together. Mm-hmm. You know, and if it wasn't for that. if it wasn't for everybody putting a wee piece in, there's yeah. been a couple of people that have took a bit out. Mm-hmm. You know, but, but you've had somebody oh, to put that back. I've had, in. I, I've had more. Of, 99% of the people I know have, have been there and they've they've put the, that piece in and they've made they've made this and they're the inspiration I love it they are the inspiration there's people good people out there because you look at the news now and everything it's all no, negative it's all. Mm-hmm. people there see good people there's mate. a lot of good 100%. a lot of good people Everywhere. out there yep and I think what's happened to Laura has been a shake up for everybody an absolute shake up for everybody. Good. Nothing. Don't take anything for granted. Never. No. You can't. No. Seize the day, as you say. Seize the Garbidium, motherfucking day. That kind yep. of stuff. Yep. All yep. that kind of stuff. And life, life's all about making memories. Yeah. Of course it is. Make it, make as many, many memories as you can. If you're on a night out, take plenty of pictures and videos because they put. They were hard to watch back, a lot of the pictures, especially if we'd done a, a slideshow at the funeral. Mm-hmm. Got the big big projector and put videos and pictures up. That was hard, picking all the pictures and stuff like that. I got help from a couple of Laura's friends to do that. Uh, that was hard. So the advice is when we're out making memories. Yep. Loads of pictures. Loads of pictures. Videos. Videos. Yeah, and plenty of shots. And lots of shots. <laughs> lots of shots. <laughs> Absolutely, mate. Uh, what's next for, for Mark Boyle then? 
What's yeah. on the, 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 the agenda? What's, what's coming in the future? Just keep doing what I'm doing. I've got the wee man into go-karting. He loves yeah, go-karting. I've so seen I, that, I, yeah. I, brilliant. I was... It puts a smile on his face. Mm-hmm. Good. He loves it. Amazing. We've got a good crowd that do it. He's made friends through it. He's got the bug. It reminds me when I was playing snooker. Snooker, that's what I was going to say. He must get that he, for his dad, that, bug, yeah. that level of commitment and bug yeah, and yeah, drive yeah. To, to keep going good. So anytime he says go-karting, we're away. You're there. I just need to get his proper cart fixed because it's all new to me. I've not got a clue and you've got to learn how to fix it because yeah. you can't rely. I've got good friends that will help us, but deep down you really know yourself when how you're... to build the cart if something goes wrong with it how to fix it so I'm learning as well so I'm actually getting my hands dirty yeah. nah, and that'll be <laughs> you know? great though oh, as well it's working good. it's a team wee team yep. effort yep so we've got a lot of stuff coming in for his cart to, to try and modify it a wee bit and make it a bit better because Marcus is the same height as me now so he needs the pedals moved and the seat moved so it accommodates him mm-hmm. so we've already done that once but he needs to get it done again because he's took another stretch so that's my focus for oh, this yeah. year because I've had a lot of past 12 weeks I've had a, like a tournament every weekend mm-hmm. so I feel bad so I take him to the indoor stuff but the outdoors the carton that he, he, he wants loves, to do mm-hmm. that's, that's like because I took him to Lark Hall for his birthday and we just used the carts there so I'm, on, I'm, I'm out there and I couldn't keep up with him and I've got my foot down but he just knows the lines um, better um, mm-hmm. I, and, uh, and I, I came off and I said to him so are they carts is your cart faster, faster than me? Or is it no? <laughs> or like his own cart. <laughs> right, right, right. I said, Is your own cart faster than these? And he's went, Aye. I was like, No. He said, I, I says, Really? Because I had the foot down. And see when you've got the foot down, you're like that. And this then it's is like far. it's close that you're you're enclosed. Aye, probably. You're, and, and you're low, low, down. low down to the, Aye, the, the, yeah. the, the, the He says, my, my, he says, Dad, these do fifty mile an hour. Mine's does seventy five. <laughs> <laughs> like, really? Is fast to go? Aye, and you're going round tight corners, oh, you know, aye. and you've got to rely on the grip. See yeah. if you don't, yeah. it's like I don't know, because you've got to, you've got to have the, the what I've learned. You've got to have the speed so your tires are warm, and that gives you your grip. But if you if you don't, and you're quite tentative, you're you're more prone to slide oh. off the track, eh? And That's obviously, if you go too fast round certain corners, which I learned, you know, <laughs> yeah. and the hard way, I, I know. So you're in the heap. <laughs> yep. So I've got. Marcus into his carton, me into my pool. Uh, obviously, I need to juggle next season. Mm. I might cut down a wee bit, like with the tournaments. That, like if I go away for Scotland and stuff, I might need to go. I can't because there's mm-hmm. like weeks here, and obviously, my work, my work been brilliant with me with holidays and stuff. So, I need to juggle everything. I need to get a big wall planner and go right carton that weekend, pool this weekend, and work yeah, it all work out. It all plan it all out. And then I'm lucky, and I'll be, not many people know this, but I made a, a statement on a, an interview that I've met a woman called K- Kate. Amazing. Brilliant. Uh, we'll be messaging a few weeks. Right. And then we're, we're chatting. Well, it's official Rue Kate, by the way. Uh, I know, I know. It's going to be on YouTube, uh, mate. Uh, uh, it's going to be on social media. Uh, <laughs> She's uh, she's been amazing. Eh? Just, Brilliant, Mark. Uh, she's brought me from here to there. Good. She gave me my spring back, my step, but you you noticed, you know, she's uh, just chatting away. There's nothing. We've not done. Uh, there's nothing serious. Uh, not so serious, but it's like we're just nice and slow. Good. Baby steps. We chat every night. Mm. There's been times where, like, when we phone and we, we chat to each other, we're on the phone for an hour, two hours. I mean, two and a half hours I think and we're at every night we chat and it's just so easy going there's no pressure there's there's nothing you know she knows everything that's going on Brilliant. and it's like it's just so easy and she's like I think she's too good for me to be honest but it's like <laughs> never, uh, never, me. Uh, never we get on we get on really well you know so it's just it's baby steps eh? so Brilliant. we're just going to go with the flow so uh, looking in the future that's the main yeah. thing having goals and looking yeah. in the future yeah that's it. Me. And keeping yourself busy. That's it. That's, busy. that's what gets you through. You've got, well, you've to, got keep to keep active. Because when I wasn't, and I'm, I wasn't even practicing or anything. You're sitting in the house and the t- telly's on, but you're not even watching it. You're just in your own thoughts. So you start overthinking. I've been there f- 
months and months I was crying near the every night you know it's like so is that the advice you'd give our listeners that are going through this type of problem with the big c word that keep yourself active keep yourself busy keep active surround yourself and and genuine people and be open and honest see mm-hmm. I'm an open book I'll no, tell I can you, see I can, that. I'll yes. tell you I, absolutely I've, I've nothing to hide no you mm-hmm. know even if it was something I'd done wrong I would go well that's why I done it yeah and then if they tell me their opinion well well I shouldn't have done that I'm sorry, you know, it's genuine. I'm not out there to hurt anybody. Or I'd like, I want to go with everybody, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. but obviously, obviously there's a time now you've got to go, right, if somebody's been out of order, you just distance yourself mm-hmm. from them and go, mm-hmm. well, I can't win there. They don't, they've obviously got something against me or whatever, right? There's not many people like that, but there's there's always, mm-hmm. in everybody's life, you've yeah, got people like that. Does, doesn't matter who you are. You've just got to... Surround yourself with good people, good positive people that have got good energy, and that's what will keep you up. Because there's so many, it's so easy to get pulled down. And if you've got people there with bad energy, they'll just mm-hmm. they'll yeah, just they'll drag you down. They'll to drag their you level. down to their level. That's all it is. Brilliant. So that's the only advice I can get. It's give you a stay busy and surround yourself with, with good people and do things that you love to do. And if the, if you're not hurting anybody, as I said earlier on, you're, you're not doing anything yeah, bad. I love that. Exactly, mate. Bro, wait, that is absolutely fantastic advice, Mark. Mark, it's been an absolute privilege to have you in the podcast. 100%. Right. Amazing, we wish Mark. you We wish you all the success and see when I for come the back, future, mate. See you when I come back next time. Can we, we'll just have fun next time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. We'll definitely, we'll we'll definitely we'll, get we'll, you we'll, back we'll, in the podcast, we'll, mate, for we'll, sure. We'll share the fun stories next yes. time, right? Yeah. Bro, wait, mate. Thanks for coming in, mate. Sharing your story. Oh. Very inspiring. And mm. you inspire people, mate. Trust me. Uh, you've inspired you me tonight. You've helped me tonight, 100%. Yeah. yeah. Even and through the tears listeners. tonight, but... But I'll wait, well, mate. it's the first what I've seen Dan cry. Yeah, I so there you go. Me. I don't. I'm not a kind of emotional person, but that I've got never me seen tonight, my brother mate. great. <sighs> yeah. So there you yeah. go. That's yeah. in all the years. It's, it's, it's a tough, hard story, but th- there's been many signs that she's there, and overlooking. There's been loads. No, there. That's absolute, the thing that's loads. amazing. There is in my eyes. There's definitely something after. There's got to be. Love it. Of course there is. Yeah. Of course there is. I'm a strong believer in it. A million percent now. Yep. And I think the, the more you you, 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 you kind of work on yourself and the, you, you, you're, you're open-minded a lot more, mm-hmm. especially when tragic stuff like this happens. And it's good to have that comfort. Well, I'm definitely with remember, you on it. Remember I go back to the story where my boss came down for Aberdeen, uh-huh. right? <clears throat> I had no intentions of getting up, but the way I see it, Laura's got me up out of bed. I love it. Because mm-hmm. she's, she's, not, she's known they're coming. And I was wanting to hide in the room all day. I love that. I was wanting to hide. And that's what and I said Laura's to her. Says, Laura's gave me the strength to get up. I love that. Yeah. You know? And she's gave me the strength to carry on and enjoy myself, you know? She's there, mate. Because she's... what use am I to, to Marcus if I'm going to be like, mm. sad and no. depressed, you know? Yeah, I, I want him it. to have a happy life, you know? Well, it's going to be hard for him, eh? But he's he's been my diamond. He's He's been a wee heart of gold, that boy, so he has, so... He's been through a tough time, so it's the least he can have us a good life. You Big know? Time. Absolutely, and mate. Mate, we wish you and Marcus and the rest of your family and your friends right, all the very best for the future, mate. Thanks Thank for you. coming onto the podcast, sharing your story. Right, have you got one final thought, JD? Thank before you we go? so much, Mark. 100% for coming in it's really helped me in the journey I'm going through now yep. so thank you Mark and I will probably be picking up the phone to you by the way yeah. <laughs> anytime anytime yeah, I'm telling yeah. you bro wait. for now we are the Devlin Brothers I'm Daz ID he's Jai D and we are Real Raw and Relevant thanks Mark